Good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to thank Dr. Coleman and Dr. Leonard for inviting me to participate, as well as Dr. Bartlett and Dr. Friedberg for their excellent presentations. And I will conclude the session uh, with a discussion of how I approach upfront and relapse diffuse surge B cell lymphoma. Uh, my name is Sarah Rutherford and I'm an assistant professor of medicine at Weill Cornell Medicine. Here are my disclosures. Diffuse large B cell lymphoma is the most common type of lymphoma. More than half of patients are greater than 60 years at diagnosis and two thirds are advanced stage. Two thirds of patients are cured with frontline therapy. Second line therapy followed by autologous stem cell transplant is standard in relapse and refractory patients. However, if refractory to second line therapy prognosis is poor. In recent years, CAR T-cell therapy has been FDA approved after relapsed or refractory state uh, in two or, prior, two or more prior lines of therapy. Three novel agents have been FDA approved in 2019 and 2020 for relapsed and refractory patients. This is a simplified treatment algorithm in which you see patients treated primarily with RCHOP or dose-adjusted EPOC-R after diagnosis of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. About 20 to 30% of patients are relapsed or refractory and are treated with second line regimens, which you see listed here. About 50% of patients then go on to undergo autologous stem cell transplant. Uh, but the paradigm after that, and even subsequent to that is shifting quickly as we have the availability now of CAR T cell therapy, which can um, be given after um, patients relapse from autologous stem cell transplant, or if they're not able to make it to autologous stem cell transplant. And we have a number of other novel agents which can be used um, within this uh, algorithm of treatment. I will first start by talking about upfront diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And when I first meet a patient, I think, will this patient be able to get our CHOP times six? There are two big categories that I consider, patient features and disease features. Within patient features, I think about their performance status, their organ function, including cardiac, renal, and hepatic function, whether they have peripheral neuropathy at baseline, HIV and hepatitis B status, and fertility issues. The disease features that I particularly pay attention to are the stage, location, and extranodal sites, molecular subtype, and fish studies. This slide summarizes who should be treated differently than RCHOP times six. And it includes double hit lymphomas, primary mediastinal large B cell lymphomas, and HIV diffuse large B cell lymphomas, primarily being treated with dose adjusted EPOC R. Those with CNS or extranodal sites being treated with either MR CHOP regimen with high dose methotrexate alternating with R CHOP, or R CHOP, or in some cases R EPOC with intrathecal methotrexate. Patients with impaired cardiac function can receive su regimens such as RCA or RCEP. Frail patients can receive mini RCHOP uh, with rituximab. And limited stage DLBCL has traditionally been treated with RCHOP times three cycles followed by radiation. Uh, but new data presented at ASH this past year uh, supports RCHOP times four in some of these patients. I'm going to focus on two of the groups that I just spoke about the double hit lymphomas and CNS prophylaxis issues. Um, the WHO classification of lymphoid neoplasms in 2016 uh, broke up the, um, these diagnoses into diffuse large B cell lymphoma NOS, germinal center B cell type, and then activated B cell type or non-GCB type. Um, there's a entity called double expressor lymphoma with co-expression of MYC and BCL2. Uh, which is called, uh, which is um, a prognostic marker, but not a separate category. And there was a separate category created called high grade B cell lymphoma with MYC and BCL2 and or BCL6 translocations called double hit lymphomas. I still use the Hans algorithm when I first meet a patient looking at particularly the CD10 and MUM1 status. 
Um, this is relevant because most patients with, with double hit lymphoma have germinal center subtype. So if I'm in a situation where I'm not able to get the fish results, I will often rely on the Hansa algorithm to help me ascertain if a patient is likely to have the germinal center subtype, particularly if they have MYC and BCL2 at overexpression by fish. And I may be more likely to treat them with our epoch to start until I have the fish results. This is supported by data from uh, the study on this slide, which looked at over 1,200 biopsies of diffuse large B cell lymphoma morphology and found that, as pictured here and here, patients with um, double hit lymphomas with MYC and BCL2 translocations and those with triple hit lymphomas were uniformly germinal center cases. There was a proportion of MYC BCL6 double hit lymphomas that did have ABC or non GCB. Um, subtype. I wanted to highlight a phase one study of dose adjusted EPOC R uh, plus venetoclax that I had the uh, privilege of being able to work on uh, this over the last few years um, for newly diagnosed aggressive B cell lymphoma patients. And I wanted you to particularly focus on the double hit lymphoma patients. 13 out of the 15 had a CR on this regimen, and the overall response rate was 97%, with a complete response rate of 93% for all patients. This regimen is promising in double hit lymphomas, and um, I wanted to highlight a clinical trial that is now open and enrolling, the Alliance 51701 study, which is a phase two to three study of venetoclax plus chemoimmunotherapy for MYC and BCL2 double hit and double expressing lymphomas being led by Jeremy Abramson. Patients on this trial will be randomized to receive the appropriate chemotherapy backbone for their subtype, um, either without um, or with venetoclax, with a primary endpoint uh, being progression-free survival. I encourage you all to open this trial at your sites if possible, or otherwise refer patients um, to this very promising combination uh, study. I want to cover CNS and relapse and diffuse large B cell lymphoma. The incidence is four to 7% and it can be isolated to the CNS or occurrence association with systemic relapse. It usually occurs within two years from the initial diagnosis. And unfortunately the median survival is very poor four months after CNS relapse is detected. You can see pictured here on the left, the CNS International Prognostic Index. And what I wanna focus on are the particular high risk sites, kidney, adrenal gland, testes, breast, paranasal sinuses, paraspinal area, and bone marrow, in which patients um, have a particularly high risk of relapse um, in the CNS. The uh, uh, retrospective study of Jeremy Abramson showed that MR-CHOP, that is high dose methotrexate of 3.5 grams, uh, per meter squared on day 15 given in combination with RCHOP21 with peg filgrassum support decreases the risk of CNS relapse. Um, the median cycles of high dose methotrexate delivered in the study was three. And in a high risk group, there was only two CNS recurrences at a median follow up of 33 months. I now want to move on to monitoring during and after frontline therapy. Uh, per the Lugano criteria, baseline interim and end of treatment PET scans are recommended. The majority of studies that have looked at doing surveillance scans following a complete response on an end of treatment PET scan do not support an overall survival benefit from surveillance. Therefore, I typically do physical exams, labs, um, and visits with patients every three months for two years, and then every six months for, for another three years. And if patients develop symptoms or have abnormalities on physical exam that are concerning, I would then do imaging and I would biopsy the most FDG AVID accessible area if I have concern for relapse. The conclusions of the upfront DLBCL um, section are that RCHOP times six is appropriate for most patients. The performance status organ function HIV HPV status should be done at the beginning um, to determine if the need for alternate therapy, if fish is not yet available and there's a high suspicion for, do, for double hit lymphoma, I would treat with dose adjusted EPOC R and then change to RCHOP if the fish is negative. CNF prophylaxis should be given in those with high risk sites. I would aim for at least three doses. 
Um, if I'm using the dose-adjusted EPOC-R regimen for a double hit patient, for example, I would use IT methotrexate and then consider additional high-dose methotrexate when the EPOC part is completed. Um, and in patients that are getting RCHOP with high-risk sites, I would um, give them alternating doses of um, high-dose methotrexate um, if the patient can tolerate. And then after a negative end-of-treatment PET-CT scan, I would monitor clinically and without surveillance imaging. I will now move on to the second part of the talk, relapsed BLBCL. And we will again pull up the algorithm that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and we are going to go through these different sections, um, relapsed and refractory patients getting second line treatment um, with the possibility of getting autologous stem cell transplant, those who may get CAR T cells, and then also novel combination therapies, including BR plus polituzumab, bedotin, tafacitumab plus lenalidomide, selenexor, and rituximab plus abrutinib and lenalidomide. There are many different second line regimens that have been used for transplant candidates, um, primarily ifosfamide and cytarabine based, but there is no superior choice. And unfortunately, the, sub, um, the outcomes are suboptimal. You can see here a number of different studies um, in which the response rates varied from about 40 to 60%, and the transplant rates were about 50%. And the progression-free survival at two to three uh, years was around 30% for these different regimens. Interesting data was just presented at ASCO back in June that a complete response may not be necessary to benefit from autologous stem cell transplant. This was a retrospective study of about 250 patients um, through the CIBMTR looking at relapsed CLBCL patients undergoing uh, ASCT who had a PET positive PR prior to that transplant from 2003 to 2013. And they were broken down into categories of early chemoimmunotherapy failure that is occurring um, 12 months or less after the uh, initial uh, chemotherapy. Um, and then a late chemoimmunotherapy failure after 12 months from initial therapy. And this study reported that the five-year adjusted survival outcomes were not different between these two groups um, with a progression-free survival of about 40% and overall survival in a 50 to 60% range and a cumulative incidence of relapse of 48 to 57% at uh, five years. And you can see that this data is, is pretty similar to data that we looked at on the prior slide, um, primarily with patients who were in a CR going into transplant. The role in administration of CAR-T therapy is likely to evolve. There are currently two products FDA approved for DLBCL patients who are relapsed and refractory to two or greater lines of therapy. Uh, the 12 month progression free survival for two of the products, um, one of which is actually being um, studied now and is not yet FDA approved, um, was at 44%. And for um, the other product, the 12 month overall survival probability was initially um, reported at 49%. Older patients who are ineligible for transplant may actually be considered for CAR T. And there was a um, recent ASCO abstract that showed um, that higher frailty scores were associated with increased toxicities, which is uh, of course expected, but it's important for us to, to gather more data over time on uh, older patients who undergo CAR-T as many of the patients enrolled on the clinical trials were not, uh, were not um, older patients. Another interesting abstract that was um, discussed at the ASH meeting in 2019 was regarding bridging therapy use. So treatment given prior to uh, CAR T cell administration uh, and the use was variable. Um, there were some patients who got steroids, some who received radiation, others got more standard chemotherapy regimens and then some had targeted therapies. Um, in general, those who received bridging therapy had inferior outcomes, uh, but I think it's not clear which bridging therapy may be most effective and that is going to evolve as uh, more and more options for therapy are available, which I'm going to talk about in the subsequent slides. There are also current clinical trials ongoing of high dose chemotherapy followed by autologous stem cell transplant versus CAR T in the second line setting. A proposed algorithm after second line therapy and autologous stem cell transplant and CAR T candidates is as follows. If patient has a CR, they should go on to autologous stem cell transplant. If a PR 
autologous stem cell transplant should be considered, as um, I mentioned on a prior slide, versus third line chemotherapy followed by CAR T. Uh, now, if the indication is strictly followed, if a patient has stable disease, um, that means that they've uh, received two lines of therapy um, but aren't technically relapsed and refractory, they could re receive a third line ter therapy followed by CAR T. However, we know in real life, these patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma that are relapsed and refractory often progress very quickly. So I can envision in many cases, a patient may receive two lines of therapy, have stable disease, but then quickly um, become um, relapsed to that therapy and then can potentially go right on to CAR T cell therapy from there. If a patient has progressive disease, either after second line therapy or after autologous stem cell transplant, they can go on to CAR T therapy with or without bridging therapy, depending on their clinical status. I now want to discuss novel therapeutic approaches. We'll talk about polituzumab bedotin plus bendamustine and rituximab, tafacitimab plus lenalidomide, selenexor, and then rituximab, lenalidomide, and abrutinib. First, I will discuss polituzumab bedotin, uh, which I've abbreviated as PV for this slide, plus BR. This was um, a phase two randomized study looking at polituzumab, which is um, um, antibody drug conjugate uh, against CD79 expressed on B cell surfaces, which is internalized and ultimately impacts microtubules in the cell. Polituzumab in this study was dosed at 1.8 milligrams per kilogram plus BR, bendamustine dosed at 90 milligrams per meter squared and rituximab versus BR at that same dose given every three weeks for six cycles. The key eligibility were greater than one prior, uh, one or greater prior therapy and greater than 100 days since autologous stem cell transplant. Exclusions included prior allo stem cell transplant, follicular lymphoma grade 3A, transformed lymphomas, and CNS involvement. And the results are listed here with a duration of response for the polituzumab arm of 12.6 uh, versus 7.7 .7 months a median progression-free survival of 9.5 versus 3.7 months, and a median overall survival of 12.4 versus 4.7 months, um, again, for polituzumab plus VR versus VR. Notable toxicity is peripheral neuropathy. There were 44% uh, versus 8% in the two different arms um, of patients that who um, experienced this toxicity, but it was primarily grade one to two. Next, I'll discuss tafacitimab plus lenalidomide. Tafacitimab is a monoclonal antibody against CD19. It has both direct tumor cell killing and enhanced ADCC and ADCP. Uh, this was a phase two single arm study of 81 patients. The schedule was cycle one through three, TAF weekly plus lenalidomide given on its normal schedule of 21 day, days on, seven days off, and then ongoing cycles dose at 25 milligrams, and then cycles four through 12 included bi-weekly doses, every other week doses of tafacitimab and then lenalidomide at the same schedule. After cycle 12, if the patient had a PR or better, TAF could continue every other week until progression. Key eligibility included one to three prior therapies uh, and patients were ineligible for autologous stem cell transplant. The overall response rate was 60% with a CR rate of 43% median progression-free survival of 12.1 months, 12 months and a duration of response of 21.7 months in those who responded. Notable toxicities were, cy were cytopenias and 43% had a dose reduction of lenalidomide. Selenexor is a selective inhibitor of nuclear export and it blocks XPO1, which is a nuclear poor protein, which helps facilitate transport of proteins in and out of the nucleus. This study, which was called SADL, was a phase two single arm study. 127 patients were in, included in the primary endpoint analysis. Selenexor is dosed orally 60 milligrams twice weekly until progression or toxicity. Key eligibility included two to five prior therapies and ineligibility for transplant or post transplant. And a notable exclusion was that prior therapy could not be given um, for 60 days um, for patients who had responded to their last therapy or um, for 14 weeks for all others. Results were um, an overall response rate of 28% with the CR rate of 
a median duration of response of 9.3 months and a median overall survival of 9.1 months. Notable grade three to four toxicities were cytopenias and fatigue. The last study I will mention is uh, a phase two of rituximab, lidabide, and abrutinib, drugs that you are all um, well aware of. This was an ASH abstract presented in 2019. It was uh, included rituximab IV dosed on day one of cycles one through six, and lenalidomide 20 or 25 milligrams dosed 21 out of 28 days, as well as a brutinib 560 milligrams dosed um, daily. And these were given until progression. Key eligibility included non-germinal center phenotype by Hans algorithm and ineligibility for stem cell transplant. The overall response rate was 47% with 28% CRs. A median duration of response of the 40 responders was 18 months. Progression-free survival at 18 months was 31%, and the median PFS was five months. Notable toxicities uh, in this uh, regimen were neutropenia and rash. The conclusions of the relapse and refractory DLBCL section is that there's no superior second line regimen Patients in PR can still benefit from autologous stem cell transplant. The role of CAR-T is evolving. It only works in a subset of patients. So it is important that we continue to look at other types of strategies. And I haven't gone into detail on clinical trials in this talk because a lot of that has been covered in prior sessions, but I do advocate for these patients to be enrolled in clinical trials whenever they are available. Um, and there are many other types of agents that are encouraging that will be coming forward. Um, we have had three new agents that have been FDA approved in 2019 and 2020, polituzumab, tafacitumab, and selenexor. There's also promising data for the non-GCB patients with rituximab, lenalidomide, and abrutinib, though this is not an FDA approved regimen at this time. And the order of therapy should be tailored to each individual patient. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to answering your questions along with my colleagues in the subsequent session.